then exactly we invest yeah. in the team the, our latest investment which in fact is our largest investment to date in our first ticket in from fund two from fund two we did four investments the latest one was a million dollar investment um we invested in the company before the founders were full-time so there's a website which is only a logo um there's a deck like a 10 slide deck both of the founders are still full-time at another company they're going to be leaving in a month so we still wanted to invest because we were bullish on the founders we were bullish on the space it's a newly emerging space there's a lot of investor appetite within the space and Welcome to YFamily.com, the podcast, a place for young entrepreneurs get inspired by people like you who don't just talk about their dreams and aspirations, but actually do and take action. So today we have Ennis Huli here. He's a general partner at 500 Startups Istanbul, and he's in charge of the Eastern European and, and Turkish uh, regions, right? So, you know, with no further ado, why don't you go ahead and tell us a bit about your background and, and what you've done so far. Hello, everyone, and um, thanks for inviting me. My name is Enes. I'm one of the general partners of Five Fund Startups Istanbul. Uh, Five Fund Startups Istanbul is the regional fund within Five Hundred, where we invest into Central Eastern Europe and Turkey. Prior to Five Hundred, back in 2010, I started my own company called Goodbuzz um, in marketing technology space. We raised a seed round back then. We had our um, team in Turkey. We had our team in Lithuania, a team in the UK. I was going back and forth between the UK and Canada. Um, I was with the company for two years. I left it to my co-founder, moved back to Turkey. I was at Rock Internet for a brief short time here in Turkey because back then they were doing a local e-commerce um, here in Turkey. I left Rocket in 2013, decided to do my own angel network in 2015, which then turned up to be a VC fund with together with 500 startups. And for the past five years, um, we've done 43 investments around Central Eastern Europe and Turkey. Wow. Impressive. So, um, yeah, let, let me j- just ask you something. So was that a joint venture between your... Kind of, yeah. So, I mean, it's like a joint venture. 500 has this um, thematic funds all around the globe in places like Vietnam, Turkey, Canada, Mexico, etc., uh, where they partner with general partners from the region. Um, the general partners ourselves, we do the fundraising, we do the deal making, we do the portfolio management, and 500 Startups acts as an enabler. Um, both on stuff like legal accounting compliance, but more so in terms of giving us a brand and a network to leverage. Um, Within 500, um, in our portfolio, there are more than 2,500 companies across 75 countries. And there has been about 30 unicorns that sprout uh, within the portfolio. And 500 gives us this framework and the network to leverage all that and to utilize for the benefit of our portfolio. Cool. Yeah, a a franchise model uh, in some way, right? We don't want to call it a franchise, but it's similar. Okay, cool. And, you know, why did you get into this, uh, you know, uh, you know, startup VC world? Uh, what motivated you to, to get into this? Yeah, what motivates me the most? Um, in, I don't think I have the guts or the courage to be an entrepreneur myself. And I feel like being a VC is a bit um, less risky, more risk averse. So from just a characteristics perspective, I think I'm, I'm a better fit to be an investor than an entrepreneur, but this is the closest I can get um, to being an entrepreneur. And I love the mission and the impact that um, both we do as a fund and then 500 does in general. Five, if you look into 2010, a lot of the VC investments across the world were pulled in Silicon Valley, but there are more engineers outside Silicon Valley than inside it. Um, there are more entrepreneurs outside Silicon Valley than inside it, but some have a bunch of the capital. Most of the capital was in Silicon Valley and five and startups wanted to democratize that on the early stage, um, democratize access to capital and access to know-how. And that really resonated with me. Um, I actually want to be able to see that um, Turkish entrepreneurs can have access to capital, much like American entrepreneurs. And since this is a global value chain, it doesn't matter where they're located, as long as they create a big enough impact, they can get capital from wherever. And there can be a lot of huge local technology powerhouses that are gonna actually give birth to a new generation of entrepreneurs in regions like Turkey. So that, I mean, I probably gave like five different missions, but all of those really resonate with me. And I think that's what pushes me, um, that what pushed me to the entrepreneurial space. And then within the entrepreneurial space pushed me to turn into a venture capitalist. Cool. Yeah, we'll get into that later into like why European startups, I mean, the European ecosystem is not as big as Silicon Valley. Um, you know, maybe it's uh, obvious, but um, but yeah. So can you like, I mean, I don't know, just 
small amount of people get to invest into startups at this you know level at this magnitude as you do um and so can you tell us uh what how did it feel like when you first invested into into a company um funny because when i when i did my first investment i was thinking that i was actually being a co-founder then i realized that i'm only an investor i'm not sitting on the driver's seat i'm just acting as an investor and then more and more over time while i was doing angel investing um i understood that acting as an investor means that you should be supporting the founder and not of course you help and support but it's more of a pull relationship than a push relationship where you're there when they want to you're not there when you don't want to and that stuck with me after i did a couple investments as an angel investor but once we actually raised the fund um we knew that this is 99% an access game where you have to make sure that you that you have access to the great entrepreneurs and if you have access to the top 5% of the opportunities in any region you're going to end up making money but a lot of the job that we do is generating access to be able to generate that access you actually have to be close with the entrepreneurs be supportive of them uh, make sure that you're actually there for them because they do the risky job i mean they put all of their eggs into one bucket whereas we have a portfolio either as an angel or as a vc so it, after i came to that realization where i'm not on the driver's seat i shouldn't be i should only be there to support them and not just because i like them and i love their entrepreneurial spirit but also selfishly to be able to have access to the best deals within my own um opportunity pool i have to act um accordingly um i think that's a great feeling um from a from a success perspective you don't feel as successful as an investor i mean say you invested in a company today and 5 years down the line that company became a billion dollar company mm -hmm. i'm sure you're happy you made a lot of money but you don't feel successful i mean what was your success you were just an investor that's it um so after a couple of years of investing as we saw some of our companies became unicorns i realized that um you don't feel successful you only feel successful if you are supportive of the entrepreneur irrelevant of the outcome okay Yeah, I mean you're part of the the story, you're part of the success as well. Yeah, right. You're, you're on the stadium cheering for them, but that's it, you're just a fan. Okay. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, you know, uh, I've heard that VCs when they get too much into the daily uh, you know, operations, they get in on the way of what of the entrepreneur, right? They should only be there when it's necessary. Do you do you share that perspective? Definitely. I mean, imagine um, at least on the early stage, you know, given our investment thesis, we're trying to find these entrepreneurs who are gonna turn out to build billion dollars or a couple hundred dollar businesses. Um, so we're actually betting on the outliers. We want that one company to give us that hundred x in return. But to be able to find that one company, you have to take a bunch of shots, do 20 investments, 50 investments, so that one or a couple of them are going to give you that 100x. And what, in the way of doing that, trying to micromanage the entrepreneur, trying to um, sit down and talk strategy, product, marketing, etc. cetera, um, A, I don't know as much as the entrepreneur about his or her space because that's his life. I only spent a couple hours a week max on that topic. And B, if I felt the need that we have to be doing this, it just shows me that this company probably is never going to give me that 100x. So I, I'd rather have my resources spent elsewhere. We're in a market where we should be um, celebrating and cheering for the entrepreneurs who are actually making it, mm -hmm. but not try to um, put in more bureaucracy to the company or micromanage the entrepreneur to be able to try and limit our downside. This is not a downside limiting industry. This is an upside, upside maximizing industry. And that has been our philosophy from the get-go, where both from a resource and financial perspective, we try to push our companies who are doing great to do even better. And also from our portfolio management and support standpoint, we try to be there for the entrepreneur when he or she needs us, but not try to um, go deeper into their business and try to give advice on topics where we're not that much familiar with anyways. Okay, cool. Well, it makes sense and um you know for early stage or you know first time entrepreneurs founders you know reaching out to investors might be scary and maybe they are a bit lost and don't know how to how to approach you guys right um how would you say um is the best way to do it and not be seen as spam right because i'm pretty sure you get a lot of uh emails or you know linkedin uh spam yeah yeah i mean first of all in the us there there's there are a bunch of stories where this one investor got this one email he didn't even bother to reply to it 
And then the company turned out to be a billion dollar company. Since a lot of people had that experience, now people do reply to those spammy cold outreach emails. And I do as well. So whatever email I get or LinkedIn message or Twitter message, whatever application through our website, I definitely respond. But I think the best way to get in touch with a lot of the investors is through network. I mean, this is a really network driven business, unfortunately. And when I look into the companies that we have invested, probably 50% of them, we reached out to them. We did the outbound effort and the other 50% came through our partners to warm introductions um, in our fund one. So unfortunately we did zero investments from um, companies that either applied to us through our website or sent an email or sent a LinkedIn, et cetera. Um, I think the best ways, this is a proximity based business, connection driven business, best ways to get introductions, but this also relationship building. So you, you shouldn't be reaching out to investors when you're fundraising. Um, you should make them feel close to you know you better and once you're there fundraising you have a bunch of people that already know you um that already have you on stage whatever stage two stage three so that you have more people across the table which would give you better terms and leverage um as the entrepreneur i see a lot of first-time founders feel like they have to be respectful of the investor and then a lot of the investors unfortunately have are really arrogant which they shouldn't be because they don't do the actual work i don't do the actual work i only do probably 10 zoom calls a day and that's all i do i build nothing um, whereas entrepreneurs are building it so um, founders shouldn't look up to their investors. They shouldn't be arrogant on the other side as well. It should be more of a level, level playing for them. That's what I'm trying to establish with a lot of the first time founders as well. Cool. Cool. And, you know, so we're talking about founders in general, but what about like, um, you know, let's say under 30 entrepreneurs, is that different? And like, what, um, should they avoid to like, in order to be successful yeah. yeah a lot of the risks that we see on um, younger entrepreneurs ties back to hiring and culture and organizational structure um, because they feel more confident hiring people around them which is great initially you have a group of five or ten people which are like a cult they're stuck together which i mean from a cultural perspective it has no diversity but from a company mission perspective, their chance of getting to the next level, I think, um, increases. But once you get to that next level, you have to feel more comfortable hiring people that are more senior than you, that know more about either the industry or the product or the technology than you. And um, people are less confident in doing that because a lot of the younger entrepreneurs, if you're cut out to build, a, if you're the best person to manage this 10-person team, potentially you're not the best person to manage 100 people or 1,000 people team. So you have to grow in the job. Uh, whereas with a bit more experienced entrepreneur, they're more entrepreneurs, they're not the best person to manage that 10 person team, but they are the best person to manage that thousand people team. So as the company grows, they even mature to a better CEO position. With younger people, they need more founder coaching to develop themselves as that organization matures. And often we see that they become the main bottleneck from an organizational and culture perspective within the company um, by their hiring choices. And that's something that we have to, uh, we're trying to push away from, we're trying to push the founder to do out of comfort hiring decisions, whether that's VP of sales or a CTO or a board member, or even a board who's going to guide and judge those decisions that the founders make. Um, I think it's a mental model and a mental obstacle that they have to pass as they go beyond a couple tens to a hundred people company. Yeah. And so do you guys do any of the coaching yourselves? Psychologically, yes. I think um, two things, three things that we do. I mean, I think there are only three benefits that we provide to our portfolio, three levels of support. Um, one of them is fundraising, downstream capital. Obviously, we know more VCs than a founder because we do this business 24-7, so I can provide those introductions. That's one thing that I definitely provide. Second thing um, on the founder coaching level um, is, I think, psychological support. A lot of the, I mean, all the companies on a daily basis, you're always doing bad. And then this one day you do great, which gives you a big jump as a company, then 100 days, next 100 days are going to be bad days for an entrepreneur. So that psychological support is, I think, really important. And part of it is founder coaching, is building those mental models for the entrepreneur to think clearly, not on the micro level, but on a, but on a macro level. Um, that we do as well, I think. We stay close to the founders. Uh, we want to be more of their supporters and you know do these weekly meetings chat with them try to understand their problems and the third value that we add is creating these analogies between different businesses maybe totally irrelevant geographies but connecting with different entrepreneurs that faces faced similar situations in a different geography different business model um again 
that I think ties to founder coaching where founders actually benefit a lot from each other. I mean, you try to create more of these um, knowledge sharing and psychological support networks within founders. Cool. Cool. That, that's, that's, that's cool. And, um, you know, so off, off record, you told me uh, the story of carbon health. Um, uh, you know, that's, that's amazing. Um, could you tell us, you know, what, you know, a couple of the best performing uh, companies in your portfolio? And, you know, if you want to get into that story a little bit too. Sure. So I think the story of Carbon Health goes before Carbon Health. Uh, I think the story is important for us to, at least for me to personally, um, see the mission behind 500 Istanbul. So Eren, the founder, um, was initially doing an educational technology business in Ankara. Um, he built a company, he had a product, he sold it to his university. He was trying to productize it and sell it, but um, he didn't have much capital. So he was trying to do fundraise, trying to speak with different angel investors where they came up with these really weird deals. They tried to take majority of the company by even investing even less than 100K. So he realized that Turkey wasn't the best place to, to do this. And 2007, 2008 wasn't the best time to build that company. Um, he moved to the Valley, become, became an engineer on a dating company called speeddate.com, which eventually got acquired by mash.com. It was 2010. He said, hey, I had this business idea a couple of years ago back in Turkey. It wasn't the right place, wasn't the right time. Maybe now is the right time and the right place. And he launched Udemy. Um, he ran Udemy until 2014. Um, he left the company afterwards. Um, now it's a billion dollar company. Um, I guess it even raised close to a billion dollars. Eren left the company about seven years ago, but the company still has its technology office in Ankara. So that's kind of the impact that one person can create in a couple of years, which is going to be sustained for a couple of decades, hopefully, uh, where a lot of the engineers that graduate from universities in Ankara, instead of working for a local bank or a local engineering company, they work for a Silicon Valley company. So they turn out to be um, entrepreneurs themselves. In fact, from our fund one, we invested into three engineers who worked at that company in Ankara and then decided to become entrepreneurs themselves. That's kind of the multiplier effect that we try to create with these local powerhouses. Um, after education, after Udemy, Eren decided to build Carbon uh, back in 2015 and we became one of the first investors in the company and invested multiple rounds. Um, they just raised a $350 million round two weeks ago. Now they're now he's uh, tackling healthcare. Why that story is relevant for me is because you see how immature the Turkish market was and how entrepreneurs had to um, go to the valley to make it. But then the sort of the, um, the value that they create back at home, although they built their company in the US is immense. And we're trying to more, create more, of, more and more of these stories. Another company and that resonates with me a lot is a company called Firefly. Mm -hmm. um, they mount these digital advertising devices on top of Uber or Lyft vehicles oh. to do out-of-home geotargeted advertising in places like New York, LA, etc. And they raised a bit more than $100 million to date. Google Ventures led their previous round. So they're not, um, they have enough cash. They can't do it. They can't easily build their software team or their hardware team in the US, but they didn't. Although the founders, two Turkish founders, both based in the US, um, one of them is based in New York, the other one was in San Francisco back then. Um, instead of building their team there, they built their software team in Istanbul and their hardware team in another city in a bit south, south of Turkey. Not because the, the talent is cheaper, because the talent is cheap anywhere except the US or Europe anyways. It's because they, they knew that they can access better talent and more importantly, retain that talent for years. Um, their average tenure would be much higher than any Silicon Valley company. So they have their software team in Turkey, their hardware team in Turkey, because Turkey is great logistically. And that also kind of validates our geo-arbitrage investment thesis, where we're trying to invest into companies who would have their back offices, their technology teams in places like Central Eastern Europe or Turkey, but their sales and marketing to the Western world, to the more mature world, either US um, or Europe. Okay. And what's something you, you think made... Uh, let's talk about carbon help, um, successful. Yeah, more and more, I believe early stage investing is all about, um, as an investor, you love the problem, you love the team and you invest and that's it. Um, talking about strategy, how it's going to evolve, what's going to be its defensibility, talking about how the value chain dynamics can change over the next two to four years. Um, I started to not believe any of that crap after a certain while. So with carbon, um, Aaron knew that um, healthcare in the US is broken, has to be fixed. And to fix it, you can't just do um, you can't just do small improvements on different technology layers. You have to replace it end to end. 
but the way to replace it end to end wasn't clear. So he pivoted multiple times. Um, initially became as a became, was a software company, then decided to have his own clinics, then merged with another clinics company, then started to roll out clinics, but also merged with them at the same time as well, which turned which made this almost like a semi real estate play, semi technology play. If you're trying to uh, disrupt something like healthcare, you have to disrupt it end to end from patient engagement. Um, all the way to clinical studies and accuracy and all of the hardwares that you're going to use um, within the clinics. So um, carbon story, and we have a bunch of different stories like that within the portfolio, kind of showed me that um, as an early stage investor, you build, you believe in the problem that the entrepreneur wants to tackle. You believe in the entrepreneur and those two are enough to build an investment thesis around it. Yeah, I've also heard that, you know, a good investor tries to find every single thing that can go right and a bad investor tries to find every single thing that can go wrong. Uh, yeah. Is Definitely. I think the, um, in this industry, false negatives cost a lot and the opportunity cost is huge. So making guesses about why a company is not going to make it and then being right on them, no one cares. You have to be um, right on things that actually do work. And to have that mentality, you have to see what should you have to think in a mental model. You're like, what should happen so that this company makes it? And if you actually can see a pattern where this company can give you that whatever X um, you want to get, that's why you invest. You're not trying to find factors why this wouldn't work because statistically speaking, there's a bigger chance of it not working. But if it does, it would give you much, much more outsized returns compared to um, when it fails. Cool. And, you know, knowing your, your goal is to bring Turkey, but also, um, you know, Eastern, Eastern Europe to the same level or, you know, very close to Silicon Valley, um, what's something you think they lack now? I think um, we're not trying to bring Turkey to the same level to Silicon Valley or Central Eastern Europe to the same level of Silicon Valley. We're trying to bring the best in Turkey to the same level, to the best in Silicon Valley. Okay. Uh, we only care about that top 1% or 5%, whatever you want to call it, of entrepreneurs who we believe can actually build these large powerhouses. Um, and if you go back 10, 20 years, there's a big difference in terms of the resources that that Silicon Valley entrepreneur is going to get compared to that Turkish entrepreneur on the early stage, but also on later stages. Uh, more and more we see that because of funds like 500 that invest globally, um, now early stage problem is kind of solved for those best entrepreneurs, at least for those A plus entrepreneurs. Access to network, access to how that's also kind of solved. You see a lot of more series B, series C investors who also invest um, globally from US coming and investing in Turkey. So I think the main mission is to make sure that those A plus entrepreneurs can make it anywhere. Even if they were born and raised in Nigeria or Turkey or US, doesn't matter. They have a similar chances of building these billion dollar companies. But given the um, limited access to capital in Turkey still compared to the Valley, we feel like we get in better terms than the Silicon Valley investor, which creates this geo arbitrage that we're trying to leverage as a fund. Because correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I feel like Europe is more conservative when it comes to uh, you know, investing into the startups. Yeah, definitely. It definitely is. And we, we see it in two effects. One of them is on early stage um, with a pitch deck, a business idea, two, three co-founders in the US can easily raise a substantial seed round, can easily get institutional capital um, because that's more of a seller's market. But Europe and Turkey, obviously, is more of a buyer's market where um, investors actually want to see something, want to see prototype, traction, whatever. So on early stage, it's tough to raise that substantial seed round. Um, that's the, the effect on the early stage. On the later stages in US, um, because the investors are more um, bullish, risk appetite is much higher, they are okay at investing at much higher multiples compared to Europe. The same company, identical company uh, with identical revenue sources, say they make money from the US, would speak with a US investor and then a European investor, and you'd see that the European investor would value it half uh, because he or she wants uh, less risk. Cool. And, um, you know, you, do you think there's going to be a time where, um, you know, because now we see a lot of European companies, uh, I mean, now less than before, but um, yeah, that are being acquired by, you know, uh, American tech giants. Do you think there's going to be a time where they're going to stay uh, Turkish, European? Yeah. Tough. Um, I think the, 
bigger question there is, um, is there going to come a time where instead of getting acquired by that US giant, um, you're going to become public yourself, you're going to IPO. Because at the end of the day, the value chain that we're in, the end of the value chain um, is the public market. So we're investing in a company, hoping that either it would IPO or get acquired by a company that has already IPO'd or get acquired by a company who's going to get acquired by a company who already got IPO'd. But the end of the value chain is IPO. And when you look into the Israeli market, they used to get acquired by these US companies a lot. And then over the past three to four years, um, doing their own IPO and staying Israeli and staying I don't want to say say staying staying private, but staying sovereign as an entity themselves became a viable option. So we see more Israeli companies IPOing to Nasdaq. In fact, we had the first Turkish technology company IPO to Nasdaq um, a couple of weeks ago. It's an oh, e-commerce wow. company called Hepsi Brata. They did a four billion dollar um, IPO. Um, I think that's going to be an option. So we're going to see that. Uh, we're going to see a lot of European and Turkish companies that instead of getting acquired by public U.S. companies, they would do their own IPOs. And um, that's definitely going to happen. But whether we're going to see Turkish companies start acquiring companies in Europe or European companies start acquiring companies in the US, I don't think so. I think just given the competitive and the market size dynamics in Turkey or in Europe, um, US is the best place to build trillion dollar companies. In Europe, they would rather have a thousand billion dollar companies than one trillion dollar company, um, just because it's really fragmented culturally, economically, and then the anti-competitive nature of the EU legislation compared to the US mm. kind of pushes for that. Yeah. You know, because I had a, a startup mentor. He told me that, uh, you know, not all companies need to go public in, you know, NASDAQ or, yeah, uh, you know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, stock exchange, uh, you know, around the world. And yeah, so hopefully, hopefully it's going to change. For that, um, we see a lot of companies Polish companies open to the Polish market, Hungary as well, um, Turkey, not so much. We still don't have Turkish local technology companies IPO to the Turkish market that much, but we'll see those. I mean, it's, it's, it's going to happen definitely. It's going to start happening definitely. Yeah, definitely. And, uh, you, you know, you kind of touched on this before, but, you know, real quick, um, what's the criteria to admit uh, a company to 500 startups? You know, you said uh, you don't tend to get people who apply on your website or, or email, but, you know, what's the criteria? I think um, looking on a macro perspective, when, when we were looking into an opportunity, we try to understand whether it's more of a blue ocean or a red ocean opportunity. For red ocean opportunities, um, the market size is there. You can actually quantify it. The market growth is there, but it's very competitive. So you have to understand how you're going to differentiate, what the metrics are. Does your differentiation actually resonate with the customer? And we try to get this from either from financial metrics or product analytics, but we look for more, right? We want to see month over month growth, unit economics, churn rate, blah, blah, blah. Um, because that's the space that you're in, we're more traction focused and our investment decision um, is going to be driven by your execution capabilities and the way for us to assess your execution capabilities are these business fundamentals and the metrics. Whereas for blue companies, these are companies that are just coming up in um, new markets that are just emerging. There's a big market risk. The market, market might never evolve to be big. We don't know, but we're not scared of competition. If that's the case, we're much more technology and team driven. We want to see, we want to validate the team and make sure that the team is uh, has enough of a war chest and resources to build that technology and we can invest much early on even without a prototype and when you look into our portfolio at five found istanbul you would kind of see a 50 50 split where half of our companies are more blue ocean companies we invested pre-prototype very early stage even idea phase we can invest whereas the other 50 percent would be more red ocean competitive we invested a bit later we wanted to understand all of these different uh, business metrics before we moved forward. You know, uh, uh, quick question here. Um, so even if it's an idea, um, you know, uh, in, at a, an idea phase, um, how do you know that's going to work? I mean, there's like a higher risk here. Like, I mean, there's nothing. You're yeah. investing in the team, right? Then Exactly. You invest yeah. in the team. The, our latest investment which in fact is our largest investment to date in our first ticket in from fund two. From fund two, we did four investments. The latest one was a million dollar investment. Um, we invested in the company before the founders were full-time. So there's a website, which is only a logo. Um, there's a deck, like a 10 slide deck. Both of the founders are still full-time at another company. They're going to be leaving in a month. So we still wanted to invest because we were bullish on the founders. We were bullish on the space. It's a newly emerging space. There's a lot of investor appetite within the space. And, um, 
this is, I think, a more of a cornered resource theory where we don't think there are a, a lot that we don't think there are a lot of engineers who can tackle this problem. And there are only a number of cornered resources, uh, cornered people that the company has to um, employ and manage well. And once we feel that's the case, we are eager to take an early on bet because we feel the main defensibility um, is the people. And it's a, it's a newly emerging market. So once you actually grab a good talent pool within your company, that's going to be enough for you to kind of um, get to the next level over the next couple of years. Okay. And, you know, we've talked about, um, you know, your portfolio companies, what has worked out, but have you missed out on any company that now you see, oh, like maybe they, they've become a unicorn and like they, they are doing very well? Definitely, definitely. Um, in Turkey, not so much. Um, I'm not sure why, but I mean, yeah, in Turkey, not so much. I think a couple of reasons. One, in Turkey, we had 100% market exposure. Um, two, because we're based here, it's easier for us to build conviction. So we were um, we were more of a risk taker in Turkey compared to Central Eastern Europe. In Central Eastern Europe, because we weren't there physically, um, although we generated access to some of the great deals, uh, we ended up not being able to build that conviction to invest because you don't actually meet with the team or the founders face to face. You don't have all the time in the world to get to know them. You have to make a decision after doing two or three calls. Um, and some of the companies that we saw in Central Eastern Europe now became a couple hundred million dollar companies. In fact, uh, when you look into our anti-portfolio companies in Central Eastern Europe, um, if we have invested into them, um, the fund right now might have been, I don't know what, 2x or what it is right now. That's why with fund two, we want to push more on Central Eastern Europe. We're looking to get venture partners in Central Eastern Europe to be able to build that conviction early on and have physical presence in those geographies. So um, if this was an access problem, um, if I told you that, oh, we didn't have, have access to those great deals and they turned out to be great, it would be a bigger problem. I think having access, but then doing the um, wrong call is easier to fix than not having access at all. Yeah. Wow. You know, this is very interesting. Uh, I think we, we've got to the end uh, of the of the episode, but I, I have one more question. So, yeah, let me just uh, put it into context, though. So previous seasons, I used to ask, what's something you want to be remembered for? But and I'll kind of change it to, like, what's the plan to conquer the world? Um, you can choose either, either of those uh, questions. Um, but, yeah. Yeah. I think um, startup investing um, in general, and then VC, venture capital in particular, is the really rigid asset class where um, it's a 7, 10 or whatever 15 year fund, you have to deploy your capital and then you're going to wait for 10, 15 years for that capital come back to you. And in the meantime, the fund is going to do equity investments into these companies who are potentially going to become a couple hundred million or billion dollar companies. This is very rigid. And I think there's more entrepreneurial spirit around the globe than that. The only way to be successful is not to build billion dollar businesses. There are a lot of opportunities where you would gladly invest some money and be able to make three to five X over the next couple of years. And those are still great investments. And at the same, at similarly, for um, investors that invest to our, into our funds, not everyone has the leverage to stay in for 15 years. Some people might want to invest, get shorter term gains, pull out. But right now it's very rigid. The secondary market for VC investments is not mature. The secondary market for startup stocks is not mature. And I feel that um, in the long run, either with crypto and blockchain coming in, we see these tokenized funds, which enable um, funds to be raised using tokens, but also creates a secondary market right after you raise the fund. So it brings earlier liquidity to fund investors. And at the same time, startup investing is also getting democratized, whether that's equity crowdfunding platforms, going public earlier on, SPACs. Um, those are really democratizing access to startups and for the general public to invest into startups. So uh, the way I see it is we started with this one product, which is this really rigid VC. Um, that's a 10 year fund we do early stage. Next to it, we have to be doing venture debt. Next to it, we have to be doing revenue share deals because not every company is built to be sold. Some companies and some founders, some entrepreneurs don't want to sell their companies and they don't want to do IPO as well. They don't want to take those bold risks to become a couple billion dollar company, but it's still profitable to invest in them. Yet we can't because of the rigid structure. With a revenue share agreement, we perhaps can. Um, I want to be able to build a tokenized fund to create um, liquidity to our investors early on. So all, I think all of these things are going to be different products. And the way I want to build it over the next 10 or 15 years, um, say in 2035, is that we have these different products that all democratize access to capital for entrepreneurs 
And depending on what type of investor you are, you can e- you can either do the investment directly yourself. You can invest into our tokenized fund where you'll get um, shorter term liquidity back. You can like this reach the VC structure. You can be more risk averse and put money into your venture debt fund where we're going to give you guaranteed returns um, on interest and we'll be providing debt to a bunch of technology companies. Um, we ha- we have to be able to productize VC rather than scaling this one rigid product. Mm-hmm. Wow, <laughs> that 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 was that was awesome. That was great. So yeah, um, if you don't have anything else to add, um, this this was awesome. And thanks for thanks for coming to the podcast. It was yeah, I really enjoyed it. Likewise, thanks for inviting me. All right. Well, thank you.